The Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center, a maximum security jail with minimum supervision and a reputation for drugs. How would you describe what happens inside the Barton Jail? Well, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is lawlessness. It's, it, it's like the jungle. You know, the, the, the meanest, toughest inmates run the place. It's not, it's not the correctional officers, it's not management. Lawyer Kevin Egan, who represented Marty Teichelitz's family at the inquest, is familiar with the issues inside the Barton Jail. The critical understaffing, the lack of programs and proper health care for inmates, the high number of drug overdose deaths including these eight men who went into this provincially run facility to be rehabilitated and were brought out in body bags. They were failed by this, by this system. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, none of them had to die. None of them should have died. Uh, you know, in the case of Marty Tycholis, he asked for help. He said, I'm a drug addict. Will you please put me on a methadone program? And their answer was no. And, and that answer came knowing that there was an underground network of, of distributing narcotics. Dr. Lori Regenstreif, who specializes in addictions medicine, took a job at the jail in 2016, hoping to provide opioid withdrawal treatment to inmates like Marty. The majority of people with opioid use disorders were not being treated while they were in. I did my best and uh, found lots of challenges. She was told, we don't do things that way here. And she was upsetting the status quo. It's not set up like a healthcare system. It's set up like, you know, a giant police station or something where there's a lot of restrictions on what you can do. Eventually, she was told she was no longer needed at the jail. The purpose is to create an environment for rehabilitation and reintegration. And it's anything but that. Julian, he, he was my best friend. Julian Walton's family believed there was still hope. They thought their son would get a second chance and come home, despite being back in the jail on drug charges. But in October 2015, Walton and his cellmate were found slumped over, still sitting against the wall where they'd been playing Monopoly. Walton was found unresponsive, still clutching Monopoly money in his hand. At that time, there were no 24-hour nursing staff here at the jail, so it was just correctional officers who responded when a code white was called. They didn't have access to the opioid antidote naloxone. By the time an ambulance arrived 20 minutes later, he was without vital signs. He died from a fentanyl overdose. He was 20 years old, the youngest of the men who died. For the Waltons, finally learning what happened to their son inside this jail was tough. That's not the Julian that I know. That's not the Julian that we know. He was a human being, and besides that, there was people who loved him. He'd been through a lot in his short life, witnessing his older brother's death in a car accident, losing his own child. He had a number of mental health issues, including being diagnosed with schizophrenia and a history of self-harm. But correctional officers weren't aware. They also weren't aware that another inmate, David Gillen, was suicidal. The 46-year-old died of a fentanyl overdose in May 2015. His death was ruled a suicide. This note found in his cell, I died alone, I died unwell, I died by myself in an empty cell, along with torn sheets that resembled a noose. When he was arrested by police, they were aware of his mental health, but this suicide prevention checklist at the jail was filled out with a straight line down the side, answering no to all the questions, including about self-harm. There was also a communication breakdown in the case of 47-year-old Peter McNellis. He also died of a fentanyl overdose a year later. Police believed these three packages of drugs that disappeared during his arrest were hidden in his body. But nothing about those missing drugs was included on any paperwork when he was admitted to the jail. He was moved to the psychiatric unit when he started acting weird, walking around naked, banging his head off the concrete floor and walls. No one suspected he had these drugs hidden inside him and he was overdosing. Packages of fentanyl, cocaine and hydromorphone were found in his large intestine. In this jail where the door is a revolving one, where there are more than 500 inmates in a facility built for 150, where it is understaffed and no one actively watches these security cameras, things get missed, overlooked and ignored. There's no enforcement, there's no real supervision in there. 
if they actually watched what was going on in, in the units, deaths would be prevented, injuries would be prevented, you know, people wouldn't be bullied to the same extent that they are, and it would become more of a rehabilitative center than, than a place to just warehouse people and then turn them back out on the street worse than when they went in. And no one is actually keeping track of the number of drug overdoses. When we asked the ministry for statistics through a freedom of information request, it was denied because the numbers don't exist. How can you gauge the drug problem within the jail if you're not even keeping statistics on it? It's totally irresponsible. There's a number of things that they don't track. Uh, in fact, I heard recently that they couldn't even tell you how many deaths have occurred in institutions in Ontario. Many of these families have been waiting years to find out what happened to their loved ones inside this building. The jury made 62 recommendations calling for a number of significant changes, including only two inmates per cell, considering random searches of correctional staff, real-time video monitoring, better health care, and tracking the number of overdoses inside those walls. For years, there have been calls for action. Yet little has changed, and inmates keep dying. Now it is time to, you know, make sure that these um, recommendations get implemented, that no more family has to go through what we're going through. It's been very up and down and heart-wrenching because most of us haven't had any answers for years. I'm sure that we're all hoping that these recommendations get taken seriously. Quite often, from a government standpoint, they look at it as dollars and cents. How much is it going to cost them? Uh, but the reality, how much can you put on a human life? What is the cost of a human life? You can't put a cost on that. And for Kevin Egan... I've personally been involved now in, I think, 13 deaths in institutions in Ontario. And every time I think, well, this is the one that's going to make a difference. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I haven't seen it. Are you optimistic? I, I try to rem remain optimistic. Um, but, you know, my, my experience, what I've seen... Uh, in the past uh, leads me to some healthy skepticism. Since the deaths of these eight men, at least five more have died in custody at the Barton Street Jail.